Why is this man smiling? Because his initials are the first two letters of every MS-DOS and Windows executable ever written. Find out why as we try to build the world's smallest fully functional Windows program. I'll walk you through the process step by step using both C and pure assembly language and a simple text editor. I'll cover the basics before I blow your mind with optimizations, so grab your favorite beverage and join me on this cool journey, because as Feynman once said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, your token gray-bearded wizard and retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS days, and today in Dave's garage, we're going to attempt to make the smallest fully functional Windows program in the world. How small will it be? Well, let's just say that the previous attempt was 3.5K, and I'm aiming to cut that at least in half. I'm going to code it up before your very eyes in pure assembly language, and along the way, I'll explain what each part does and why we need it. To make sure that I can't be accused of any smoke and mirrors, I'll do it all right in Notepad and then assemble it from the command line. No fancy IDE for me, and no tools that obscure the details from you. I'm going to explain the fundamentals of what a Windows program, especially one written in assembly language, needs to do and how it does it. Once the basics of the app are complete, we'll continue to optimize it in some very aggressive ways. Before we worry about how small we can ultimately make it, let's take a look at a few examples for context. The first thing we can do is to bring up Visual Studio and create an empty Win32 desktop application. It produces a basic application with a resizing frame, a title bar, and the various other features that we'll want to include. And when you build it for release, even optimized for size, the file is still 104K, and all it does is open a window. I find the fact that the sample template is 104K to be particularly rewarding because when I wrote the original task manager for Windows back in the XP days, my goal was to provide all the functionality you've become familiar with and yet keep it under 100K, which I managed to do. I did so by keeping the code small and efficient, of course, but also by removing the compiler runtimes and re-implementing the bits of functionality that I needed from them on my own. I also limited the number of DLLs that I statically linked to for reasons that will become apparent shortly. Of course, it grew over the years, and between the switch to 64 bits and the various many features that have been added, the Windows Task Manager binary is now over 4 megabytes. Now remember, when I say completely functional, I don't just mean an application that runs and returns a value. I mean it must create a top-level frame window, and it must have a caption and a title bar. It needs to have working widgets for minimize, maximize, and close, along with a working system menu. It must paint its client area fully and render some centered text in the middle of it. And finally, it must be resizable from all sides and repaint itself properly whenever we do so. Before we dive into the assembly language, let's take a look at the basic structure of that C program that Visual Studio kicked out as a starting point. It contains all the fundamental elements that are required by a simple Windows program, so let's see what those are. Now, like any program, ours needs an entry point. Normally, the linker will set that to be something like WinMain CRT Startup, a function that lives behind the scenes in the compiler's library and which initializes the runtime and then calls your own WinMain function. And that's where we take control. One of the main duties of the WinMain function is to register a window class. A class describes the window that you're going to create by defining the basic attributes of the window. So you might specify the flags to indicate that it has a resizing frame, title bar, what the cursor style is, the background color, and so on. All of the basic features of the window are defined by the window class itself. Once the window class is registered, the code calls its init instance function, which does the work of actually creating the window and showing it to the world. And as soon as a window is created, your code is responsible for responding to the myriad of Windows messages that are sent to it. The system sends your window handle a message for almost every conceivable event, such as the mouse moving a pixel over it, clicking the window, the window being activated by somebody else, and so on. For any system event that could possibly be of interest to a windowed application, a different message is sent. For the vast majority of such messages, if you're content with the default behavior for the message, you simply pass it along to a system function known as def window proc, which does the default processing for whatever that message is. If you wish to customize the way the message is handled, such as when the WM paint message comes in telling the window to render, then you would add code to special case and process that particular message without just handing it off to def window proc. These messages are received and processed by your code in a function that you write known as its window procedure, or windproc. It's just a function provided by you for your window so that the system can call you to dispatch each message, one by one. Each message intended for your window is sent to its window procedure function so that you can decide whether to handle the message in a special way or just hand it off for the default processing. We could ignore most of the messages because there are only a very few that we need to be concerned with. As you can see from the code, the first one we care about is WM command, which is sent when a button is clicked or a menu item is selected. 
The code also handles WM Paint, but doesn't actually render anything interesting in the default sample. This is where we would add our code to paint the string Dave's Tiny App in the middle of the window. The only other message the code cares about is WM Destroy, which is sent when the window is finally closed. It uses that message to recognize that the user wants to close the entire program, and it calls the system's post quit message API to shut down the window procedure loop and ultimately exit the program. Now that you've seen the basic elements of a Windows app, we're going to turn our attention to doing those same essential things in assembly language for the ultimate in brevity and compactness. Before I run too deep into the weeds of assembly language, let's talk for a minute about how an assembly language program is made. It might feel a bit mysterious, but it's reasonably simple. In brief, your code goes through an assembler to produce an object file of machine code, and the object file is then processed by the linker to produce an executable program. If the case is simple enough, the assembler could even invoke the linker for you, so you could do everything with a single command. We'll be using MASM, the Microsoft Macro Assembler. It's actually the very same one I used when I was working on MS-DOS in the early 90s. MASM is used to create object code in the format of executables or dynamic link libraries. The object code that the assembler generates contains unresolved references to functions and data defined in other object files or libraries. These references that you've included by calling other functions in other libraries are known as external symbols. The linker is the next step, and it's a program that resolves those external symbol references by linking your object code with the required object files or libraries. It puts the object code for your program and the code for the libraries together into one big binary file. Once they're combined, it can then fix up the jumps and references between them. What comes out is a fully executable Windows program. Now, the original MS-DOS programs like command.com had no file format or header at all. The system just loaded them into memory and jumped to the first byte. They were also limited to 64K, so a new format was added, the XE file, which has a proper header. Our program is made up of an MS-DOS loader stub, a program header, any resources like icons that might have been included, and then the code that makes up the program. The loader stub is the code that tells you to need to run the program under Windows if you try to run it on MS-DOS. Following that is what's known as the PE header for Portable Executable. Every program since the original .exe file format was created and on through today has always started with two characters, MZ. MZ stands for Mark Zubikowski, who started at Microsoft back in 1981 as the dev lead for MS-DOS 2 and who stayed there for 25 years. Not on MS-DOS, but at the company. He's even nicer than the spectrum makes him look and about twice as smart. After the MZ bytes comes the PE header, which tells the system about the details of the program, like the timestamp, the address of the symbol table within it, if any, and so on. After the main PE header comes a more detailed optional PE header that contains things such as the entry point, the amount of stack to reserve, and other handy information. Eventually, you'll find your code near the end. To take you on a tour of the assembly language version, I'll jump around the file a bit in order to show it to you in logical order. We won't be linking to any kind of compiler runtime, and execution literally begins with our main entry procedure, so let's start there. The first thing it does is to reserve memory on the stack for a startup info structure. A good Windows app needs to take a peek at its contents to know whether to start minimized, maximized, or in default. We first call get module handle to get the handle to our own program instance and memory, because we'll need that later when calling other APIs. For completeness, we also get any command line that has been passed to our program. Our main entry function is then going to call winmain as a subroutine. That will in turn create the window and start the message pump, and when the window is closed, it will return back here and exit. Let's take a look at winmain next. We make room on the stack for a few local variables, like a message structure and our win class definition, before we get busy with the business of actually creating our window. We start by getting a handle to the default application icon and the default cursor. Just like the C version, we need to register our window class next. We fill out the information needed, like our instance handle, the background color, class name, and so on. We need to specify an icon and a cursor for our window, so we call it load icon and load cursor to get the system defaults, which are fine for our purposes. Next, we push the address of the win class structure that we just filled out onto the stack and then call register class EX. When the window class is registered, we can now call create window. We push all the parameters onto the stack. Those include details like the desired window height and width, the title text, the instance handle, and so on. Then we call the API. Once we check the return value to verify that the window was created successfully, we call update window to force an initial repaint. That will in turn erase the background and then cause WM paint to be sent to our window procedure. And that's where we turn next, to the windproc function. The windproc reserves space for some locals and then it checks to see if the message is WM destroy. If it is, we call post quit message to shut down the window and return to our caller in main entry. 
If it's not WM destroy, we check to see if the message is WM paint. If it is, that's our indication that we need to render the contents of our window. In order to do that, we call begin paint to obtain what's known as a device context. You might want to think of it as a handle to a canvas and a set of tools that you can paint on it with. And you can change the line width, color, drawing modes, and so on, all of which are remembered in that context for you. Our background will already have been erased by the system's default handling of the erase background message, so we just need to draw our text. We set the background mode for the text to transparent and then call get client rect so that we know where to center our text. After loading the address of the text and setting the style parameters, we call draw text to do the actual drawing. The text is all that we draw here, so we can simply call end paint when we're done. That closes the device context. If the message was neither WM destroy nor WM paint, then we hand the message off to def window proc, which is that system API that does the default handling for any messages that we don't need or want to process ourselves. This version of the assembly is essentially the same binaries I produced the first time I tried this, and it winds up around 3,500 bytes. If you then do compress it with the UPX packer, you can get it down to right around 3,000 bytes. And by using a specially optimized linker known as the crinkler, I got it down to about 2,500 bytes and was able to fit it inside a QR code. But now we want to go even smaller. To do that, we have to identify where the biggest potential size savings can be found. And sure, the code could get maybe a bit smaller, but not that much. If we look at the hex dump of the binary, though, we discover there's a lot of stuff in between the PE header and our code. What is that stuff? Mostly, it's the set of import tables that the linker has had to add in order to enable us to call out to the system DLLs like user32. It's how we can call functions like create window. There's a big table of functions, and they're populated with the offsets that we jump through to actually make those API calls. And these import tables take up a lot of room because those APIs contain a lot of functions. Whether it's a library or a DLL, whenever you statically link to something that the linker or loader has to resolve for you, your program will contain what is essentially a jump table with an entry for each function. The more exports in the library in question, the bigger the jump table. This jump table is better known as the import table. An import table is a data structure that lists the external symbols that are needed by the object code and the DLLs or libraries where those symbols are defined. The import table also contains the addresses of the symbols in the DLLs or libraries. When the object code is loaded into memory at runtime, the system loads the required DLLs and uses the import table to resolve the external references by linking the object code with the symbols in the DLLs. For example, if the object code contains a call to a function defined in the Windows kernel 32 DLL, the linker will create an entry in the import table for the function and specify the address of the function in the kernel 32. When the object code is loaded at runtime, the system will load kernel32 DLL and use the import table to resolve the external symbol reference by linking the object code with the function in the real kernel32 DLL. The import table is typically located in the iData section of the object code and consists of an import descriptor table and one or more import address tables, or IATs. The import descriptor table lists the DLLs that are required by the object code and the functions and data defined in those DLLs. The IATs contain the addresses of the imported symbols. The linker updates the IATs with the actual addresses of the imported symbols at runtime. So in summary, the MASM linker uses import tables to satisfy calls into system DLLs like kernel32 and GDI32 by linking the object code with the required symbols in the DLLs at runtime. This allows the object code to access the functions and data defined in the DLLs without having to actually link in the entire DLLs at compile time. So how small could such an app be made? Well, as noted earlier, with the import tables, it's around 3K. And that's where it lingered for a year or more, until I received a cool suggestion, complete with code examples, from a viewer named Lasse Jensen in Denmark. He goes by the handle of Fenric, and his approach was to remove the import tables simply by not linking them into the system DLLs. Instead, his version loads the dozen or so APIs that we do need to call dynamically at runtime. Instead of keeping a jump table of every function used in the DLLs, we simply look up the few that we do need when we need them and then store them in our own little jump table, which is not only much smaller, but also gets constructed in RAM rather than laid out in the binary. This eliminates the import tables and will hopefully bring our binary under 2K. Let's try it and see how it works. Before we do anything else, we have to remove the import lib statements that would otherwise pull in user32, gdi32, and kernel32. That's the actual space savings, but then how do we call the functions that we need in those DLLs? Well, we're just gonna call the system's load library API with the name of the function that we care about. We have a chicken and egg problem, however, in that load library itself is a function exported from kernel 32. Thus, finding kernel 32 must be our first order of business. This is one of the trickier parts of this program, but bear with me and I'll explain how it works. 
The code searches through a list of currently loaded modules to find the module named kernel32dll. It does this by starting at the beginning of the list of loaded modules and then iterating through each entry in the list until it finds what it believes to be the correct module. The code uses the FS segment register to find the address of the process environment block, or PEB, in memory. The PEB is a data structure used by the operating system to store information about a process, including information about its loaded modules and so on. So once the code has the address of the PEB, it uses this address to find the address of the loader data structure, which contains the linked list of loaded modules. And kernel32 is always going to be loaded by default. The code then begins iterating through this list by following the flink pointers, which are the next pointers, for each entry in the list. For each entry in that list, the code retrieves the base address of the module and the module's name. It then compares the 12th character of the module's name to zero or null. If this character is not zero, the code moves on to the next entry in the list. If the 12th character is zero, the code has found the correct module and it stops iterating. To be much more robust, it could certainly check the hash or do a literal string compare against kernel32.dll, but assuming the length is kind of a hacky shortcut that works because we know that amongst the modules that are loaded by default, only kernel32 can match. Once we know the base address of kernel32, we can find the location of specific functions by hashing the name and then looking for that hash within the function table. When a match is found, the find function compare code works its way through the table to extract the actual entry point of the function. We do that for each of the functions we need in three core DLLs, kernel, GDI, and user. We then store their values in our local jump table. Once we've located everything we need for the DLLs, we fall right through into the main entry code and proceed as normal. The full code to both of these versions is available on GitHub at the link in the video description. The readme file also includes all the requirements if you want to pitch in and make it even smaller somehow. But for now, we're going to assemble this smaller version in two steps. First, we compile it with Masm. Next, we use the linker to build the executable, but we pass a couple of extra switches that specify we want to merge linker sections. This means we wish to merge our code and text sections into one so they take up less space. Rather than spacing out those sections on large boundaries, we specify that our sections can be aligned on as little as 16 bytes, which packs them more tightly. When the binary pops out of the linker, we can determine the file size we've actually achieved. And checking the XE, we see it comes in at just 1,264 bytes, small enough to fit within a single network packet. But we're not done yet, as we can optimize further by using a special linker created for the demo scene known as Crinkler. When we link with Crinkler, we get just 927 bytes, less than 1K. Of course, as small as that is, the question is obvious. Can we make it even smaller? Well, I already know how I can shave probably another 50 bytes or so off of this total, so if you're interested in technical topics like this, please make sure you're not just subscribed to the channel, but also that you turn on personal notifications. My topics are fairly niche, and without it, you'll miss some of the nerdiest stuff. I'm also going to provide a link to a page I just found today from a viewer named David, who did an amazing job of this same approach, but it turns out all in C. His version comes out of the linker at just 1,312 bytes before using Crinkler, a mere handful more than our assembly version. His page does a great job of demonstrating what we just covered here today without doing it in assembly language, so it's definitely worth a look. David also uses an extra step of manually editing the binary to remove some unneeded space and fix up offsets. For now, with manual hex editing and the compression, David wins the race to the bottom at 874 bytes. I encourage you to check out this innovative solution while I get busy trying to shave another 50 bytes off somewhere. Hey, it's Editor Dave here, as you can tell by the glasses. I've got some late breaking news. We've been working on this code right down to the wire in parallel with the filming of the episode, so I have to give you this update. Rutger, who runs all of our source code out of the Netherlands and who actually contributes to a lot of the projects and does a lot of the work, let's face it, he and along with Lassa, who came up with the import descriptor eliminator solution, have been working on this back and forth and kind of trying to one-up with each other, I believe. Lassa got it down to 801 bytes, and then with a little tweak to Crinkler, Rutger was able to get it down to 644 bytes. So our final size is 644 bytes. That crown and scepter I stole from Steve Gibson are still safe for the day. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. And as noted, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. 
all next time on Dave's Garage. So grab your favorite beverage and join me on this cool journey because as Flyman once said, oh, you got to breathe, man. You got to breathe.